Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Archive. I am your host, Holden, and this is episode 21. This is actually the second recording of episode 21, since I didn't have the settings right in Audacity, so the first recording sounds kind of like garbage. But rehearsals are nice. It's been a while since I actually recorded an episode. I think the last time I recorded was late February, because I was in the middle of school. But now that's all done with, so back to recording podcasts. Hopefully I can um, get a few done this summer. In fact, I'm actually nearing the end of this chapter in the in the in the podcast concerning Wii games. There's only a few more left to review and then I'll be moving on to different consoles or different handhelds. So let's see how this goes. Anyhow, I hope everyone who's listening is doing well uh, on this God bless day. And I hope you enjoy the show. Before I begin the show, I'll just address the fact that my schooling didn't exactly go as planned, and now I have to wait a year to repeat one class. Um, I was taking practical nursing, and the practicum didn't go so hot. I'm a little cross about that still, and, and that might affect the tone of the show. And frankly, that might be a good thing. I think the show could use a bit more edge. So, yeah, well, I figure I can use my grouchiness to my own advantage. So, here's hoping that goes well. But getting back to the show, I have a number of things to talk about today. Um, E3 just happened maybe two weeks ago. So, I'm going to give my cold take on that. I'm not really going to talk about E3 so much. I'm going to talk about things around E3, more importantly. Things that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. Anyhow, I also played some games, so I'll be talking about that. And of course, as usual, there'll be a game review to round out the show. So, just to get right into it. I'll start with what I played for the past week and a half. And I didn't play a lot, but I played a couple games on GameCube with my nephews. The one game I played was Pac-Man Versus. I managed to track down some Game Boy Advances, which aren't terribly cheap, but I got some for a good price, about $80.00. Each, $80 each. I bought three for reasons that I won't get into. But you only need one for Pac-Man Versus. And the uh, the boys enjoyed that quite a bit. I told them it was like a haunted mansion in Nintendo Land. And they, uh, they love that game. And that game is really great. So they jumped into that. And I, I think there's just something innately interesting about one player in a local setting having their own screen that's secret from all the other players. That's um, tantalizing for the other players to want to uh, get a hold of. And so they, in the game, if you, you the players on the TV are the ghosts, and the player on the GBA screen is Pac-Man, and you're just playing Pac-Man. And uh, whoever catches Pac-Man gets to be Pac-Man. So that was kind of the incentive uh, for them to play it. And they really they really enjoyed it. And I thought it was pretty good, too. I think it's kind of simple. It's just Pac-Man. I'm sure there's some hidden techniques that I haven't thought of yet. And maybe the fact that I'm playing with little kids that are like 8, 7, and 5 makes it really easy to just grab all the pellets before I'm even caught, or most of the pellets. But yeah, the game seems kind of small. I bought it super cheap, so I'm fine with it. Um, It's really cool still, but just sort of simple. 
separate. It's just you boot the game up and it's just a, a multiplayer mode where you pick, I don't know, six or seven levels. There's no leveling up or uh, unlockables to work towards or um, gameplay incentives. You just press start and then you play the game. And there's no records of what you do. It's just player one, two, three, and uh, the one, I guess, player four. I will say that um, the most interest, not the most interesting thing, but one of the interesting things about the game is that uh, how they handle switching up controllers where whichever player gets Pac-Man then switches the controller with the one holding the Game Boy Advance, but it manages to keep each ghost that you were or that you are... um, it, it like um, swaps around the ghost to different controllers, so you won't ever be holding the same controller necessarily as the game goes, but it keeps track of which ghost you were. So that's that's kind of interesting. The other game I played was Super Mario Strikers. This was never a game I was intending on owning. I looked at it on YouTube, and it seemed like a lesser version of its successor on Wii. And after playing it, I'm still probably of that opinion. But there's something about the game that is interesting in that it's maybe it's deceptively simplistic and all the complexities of the game are subtle as opposed to its sequel where everything you can do in the sequel that's super cool and uh, complex, all the mechanics that they want you to focus on, they're very overt it's just a matter of executing those uh, overt tactics, which good luck pulling them off. But in uh, the GameCube version, it's not apparent exactly how you're supposed to develop as a player. There are certainly some little interesting intricacies, but they're not they're not terribly exploitable thus far, but they're, they're, they're there. And I'm just curious if the game is one of those games where you really have to play it for a while before you um, pick up techniques and become a good player. Like there's a few interesting things you can do in the game. Like the successor, you kind of have a charge shot, but it's not really a charge shot. You're not charging the ball to increase your chance of scoring. You're just doing a power shot and the power shot can stun the goalie well that's all well and good and you can score on the goalie while he's stunned the you're all the little ai players because it's a soccer game i don't know if i meant brought this up it's a soccer game yeah it's a four on four soccer game but the ai um controlling the soccer players whether you're playing against a human or not the all the soccer players are moving into position they're very good about getting the getting into the net and retrieving the ball before you can follow up when you stun the goalie. So it's a thing you can do, but it's not super exploitable. There's also lob shots like in the successor, but I find that it, in the successor you could goad the goalie out of the net. Uh, it was very difficult. You had to use a character that could deke in order to not get caught. Or you could, if you were sitting on the the blue line, if you waited long enough, eventually the goalie would rush you and you could lob the ball over him to score. But I haven't had any luck with the uh, lobs yet in the game. That being said, when I've played harder computers, they seem to always try to be lobbing it into the net more so than I'd figure. Those possibilities aside, the game just seems very simplistic. Like, the successor was just so much more than the GameCube game. For instance, the GameCube game, you have different captains, and they might have different stats to them. They might be slightly faster or have a better deke, but I have no idea. It just seems like everybody can keep up with everybody, and all their shots are relatively the same power. It's it's hard to say. And then all your sidekicks, you can only pick one sidekick. One group of sidekicks, so all three of your sidekicks will be a Toad or a Hammer Brother, rather than in the sequel where you actually had a chance to do proper team composition with playmakers, defense, uh, shooters. None of that. All the 
all the sidekicks are just they're, they're they'll just be the same person you pick and all of them seem to have the same stats as any other sidekick options um the toads seem to be the exact same as the hammer brothers and the koopas to the hammer brothers there might be some differences but i don't really know and all their deeks are the same there's no in in the successor again you had you had defensive moves or you had uh i guess jukes teleports um counters i'll call them counters like with the hammer brother every different player had their own different thing not in this one you just you can do a deke or you can do like a chip and the chip in this one's much easier to do in the sequel which is nice but it's still basically there's no difference in team compositions that i've seen thus far and so what you do in the game is just a simple game of passing and shooting. When I play with the nephews, it's what I always try to tell them. Boys aren't very good at listening, or all children aren't good at listening. It's really quite simple, the things I tell them. It takes them a while, but they got it. And it's a simple game of pass and immediately shoot, and you'll probably get the shot in. If you get a breakaway and can move in on the goalie for a closer shot, when you make the pass, you're more likely to score, or if you pass to a player the goalie's not looking at that's also going to increase your chances of scoring there's also aerial shots if you want to do a lob pass which i think those have a less likely chance of getting in i think it depends where you are but you only do a lob pass if the field is busy so the game just seems kind of simple even even so I, it's been fun even though it's kind of simplistic but the one, the one boy likes it quite a bit. So we've been playing that. Sometimes we're on a team. Sometimes I go against him, and he's getting better. Um, so I, it's it's one of those things where it might be like a double dash situation where there's just lots of subtleties that make the game uh, super fun to get good at rather than a modern game where they're just trying to show you every feature and technique early on because they want to sell you how cool the game is. Which, I feel like that's what all modern games are like. They're all they're very just insecure in a way. Whereas older games, yeah, they had hidden things about them that they didn't really care to share with you or not. Or you could find them, but it was harder to find them. Or it's all in the manual and I just haven't read the manual. And that's why it's secretive to me. Or esoteric, rather, not secretive. But that's the game I've been playing for the most part. Aside from playing games, I've been buying games for the past six months quite quite often. Just to review on this show, I'm not really collecting games so much. I'm just buying games for their respective systems so I can have a better, more rounded appreciation for those systems' libraries. And thanks to having a Wii U, I can pretty much buy every game for the GBA that I'd want, more or less. I think there's like 70 Game Boy Advance games on the Wii U, and a lot of them are the obvious picks. Since I have a GBA, though, I was also able to pick up WarioWare Twisted, Mother 3. So I'm, I'm rounding out my... I, I think I'm almost... I almost have every game I want for the GBA. I have every game... More than every game I need for the Wii and the uh, GameCube. For the Wii U and the 3DS, this was kind of interesting where I kind of thought I had owned every game that mattered on those systems, but now I'm finding more with the 3DS than the Wii U. But I'm finding all these games that I never really paid too much attention to. Um, I'm finding they're interesting. And so I've been purchasing a couple of those to round out my catalogs. So that's been fun. I haven't played any of them though yet. But that's really all I've been doing in terms of um, playing games or buying games. Now with that all out of the way, I'm going to move to the main topic of this show. Um, in my first recording, this probably took like an hour and a half to go through. I'm going to try to do it in 30 minutes, but I'm going to talk about E3. More specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, just the game development in general on the Nintendo Switch. 
But for E3, um, I'm not. I haven't been really all that impressed with any of their directs since maybe 2017, and even that was only a fine direct. It wasn't incredible. But this direct actually had a few games I cared about, or not that I cared about personally, but I could see as being appealing or worthwhile to talk about bigger projects, for lack of a better word. I think the big game showed there was uh, Metroid Dread, which that game, I'll say it looks really good. The game from the trailer just looked like it was developed by Mercury Steam, and sure enough, it was. And like it's... uh, like the game they developed on the 3DS. The movement in that game looks really good. The combat opportunities associated with that movement also look really good. But they've taken things that could have potentially been a problem in the uh, 3DS game and made them fix them, for lack of a better word. Even though I wouldn't say that the counter in Samus Returns was ever a problem, it just presented the possibility of becoming a problem because the counter required Samus to sort of stand still and deliver a a strike. And after you delivered that strike, you could just kill any enemy in one or two shots. If you flubbed that strike or got hit, it'd take like 20. And so it kind of presented an issue where it rewarded standing still and waiting for the enemy to do its very predictable attack rather than moving around the enemy or using your platforming skills to jump over the enemy, things like that. It wasn't a problem in that game. It certainly worked. But in this game, they've now made a dash counter. So now you can keep moving and repel the enemy. They also added the ability to free aim with the second analog stick the right analog stick while you're running in the 3ds game you had to stand still to free aim and the free aiming felt really good in that game and you can still do that stand still free aim but now you can also move your arm cannon around while running they also added a slide that looks really good it really um incorporates into the move sets quite well from what i looked at on treehouse i never saw them use the morph ball once so i'm wondering how much the morph ball will come into play. And they also remove the spider ball for spider, uh, for, for the spider magnet. And so now you can climb certain magnetic walls with your hands and also be able to shoot rather than just being vulnerable in a little ball. There is an interesting thing where this is a limitation because the spider ball in Samus Returns could just go anywhere. This, um, this mechanic is tied to certain magnetic surfaces, but it's it's faster. Just the game in general seems faster and more fluid. And um, people always said Zero Mission was a game that controlled really well. And Zero Mission didn't control poorly, but I never really got the excitement about that game's controls. But this game, I'm kind of feeling it more like where it feels really good to move as Samus. Otherwise, graphically speaking, I think the game looks good when it's zoomed out and it's 2D and like its predecessor, there's an emphasis on very three-dimensional looking uh, environments in, within a 2D game, like big sprawling caverns in the background with uh, big architecture. The lighting in this game looks really good. Um, the game looks considerably better than the 3DS game because smaller, finer details on the 3DS just weren't going to... Uh, come out as much as they are on a switch game but it's definitely the the graphical style of the game reminds me of the 3ds game though it certainly in the early footage seems more uh synthetic i guess (laughs) less organic less uh less cultured and more um research like i don't know what the word would be It looks more like a lab than a temple, is what I mean to say. And then the other game, there was a few games to talk about. Um, SMT5 looks good for people who like SMT. I probably would never enjoy that game because it's, I don't know, I just wouldn't. But that game looks good. And then the other game that they announced was WarioWare Get It Together. And WarioWare Get It Together is interesting because it's like a WarioWare game. 
except in the old WarioWare games, the scenarios, the micro games that you were put into, it's um, you would just hit the A button or use the D pad when you needed to to like control the situation or scenario directly in a kind of a one to one way. In this game, you are using a playable character, like a little. Almost like it's a side scroller, like War. It's Wario. It's um, all his friends. They're just these little dudes now, and they can float around or throw things. They have their own various different move sets. So now, instead of the player just directly interacting with the scenario, they're now controlling a character to uh, accomplish the outcomes that they otherwise would have done themselves in the past. It's a very big change that didn't strike me as very big at first. It's also co-op because it's using the whole Joy-Con thing. So now there's a big emphasis on co-op too. So it's, you know, it's using the systems uh, features like WarioWare games have always done. Though those games typically were launch games or they became launch games with the DS and the Wii. So getting a game that shows the system's features four years in is kind of odd. A game looks good though. My only concern, though, is because every mini game is, or micro game, it's not a mini game, a micro game, because every micro game has you controlling one of these little characters, it might present the issue where all the micro games are essentially homogenized, like they're just that certain thing. Because essentially, your player action is moving this little dude around, and there's a bunch of little dudes and dudettes to control and they all have their differences but it would just seem like yeah your player verb that you're doing for each mini game is going to be the exact same type of game but that com that that concern could be really nothing so it's probably nothing otherwise though i mean i don't know there's a few more announcements i could get into to move past the games for this e3 i will just quickly say that the presentation value of their directs and their e3 presentations isn't very good anymore back in the miyamoto days and the reggie and uh iwata days the iwata days really um those presentations were so much more lively sometimes they dragged on one game for a little too long but typically the game they were talking about for a long period of time was the game that was newly announced anyway so it was all good they were doing fun deep dives into those games that you wanted to hear them talk about more. With this new style, you just have the two hosts, um, Takahashi and Koizumi. They kind of just tell you to have a look when you're already doing that with your eyeballs anyway. Like, I'm like, I'm, I would, I'm already watching the video. You don't need to tell me to watch the video. And so their interjections are just that. Or their interjections would be... Uh, what you just saw was this thing that you just saw. I'm like, I know I just saw that. And they would just, they wouldn't have anything to add to that or any insights into the game that they're commenting on. They would just repeat ad nauseum uh, the title of the game and that it's being released on the Switch. So their showmanship is quite woeful, which for Koizumi, I don't think he lacks showmanship, but this style of direct does not uh, convey that. And the other problem with the Direct is that um, they just seem to fixate on games, DLCs, um, uh, add-ons, whatever you want to call it, known quantities way too much. And like they talk about indie games for as long as they talk about uh, the bigger Nintendo games. They talk about expansions for as long as they talk about these newly announced games like WarioWare. Um, they talked about Mario Golf longer than they did Zelda we talked about Age of Calamity's uh, expansions longer than they did the actual new trailer for Zelda. Uh, or they talked about the Game & Watch, which is a cute little thing, but it's I'd rather them focus more time on actual new announcements of new actual games. Like, they must have talked about WarioWare for 40 seconds. And um, at one point after the presentation, they had a six-minute developer interview with Sakamoto on Metroid Dread and they could have easily inserted that into the direct and just cut out some of the useless fluff um, announcements that were nothing most of those announcements like just a reel of 
here's an indie game that came out already that's coming to Switch. Here's a collection of games that are old that are coming to Switch. Here's here's a second announcement for Mario and Rabbids, which you already saw in the Ubisoft press conference. Yeah, just not helpful information, just fluff. And they could definitely spend more time on actual game announcements for new games rather than just this sort of second rate announcements so that's my big complaint about e3 it's it wasn't very enjoyable to watch at all i would have rather just watched trailers for the games i cared about on like the uh the youtube tab e3 aside looking at um 2021 for a nintendo in general oh before i do that i forgot to mention the fact that I thought their Zelda trailer, which everybody I'm sure was so hyped about, um, I thought that trailer sucked. It was about 20 seconds of footage with a couple new mechanics. Um, I thought the sound mixing was weird, just like it was in the first one. Um, Just a very brief, unimpactful trailer. And yes, there's some Easter eggs to dig out. Yeah, not, not an incredible trailer by any means. Unless, I mean, you could say it's like a teaser trailer, but it's not framed as a teaser trailer. It's framed as like just a general trailer. And it was so short. And that goes into my problem with them fixating on all these dumb announcements that are second rate when they could be spending more time talking about this game. And if they don't have a lot to show about this game after what's going to be four years in development, then that's its own problem. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Though, E3 aside, uh, as I was saying, 2021 is becoming a pretty reasonably good year for Nintendo. Not exceptional. Some people might say it's an exceptional year. Uh, Those people are just probably impressed with just about anything. But the year, when you look at Pokemon Snap 2 came out, uh, and that game, it's not going to blow your socks off, but it seems like what the people want. Uh, Super Mario Golf. Reviews are coming out for that game, and it doesn't seem like that's going to blow your socks off either, but it seems fine. It seems like a good game. Ish. Like re- reasonably good. I'll talk more about that one later. Uh, uh, WarioWare, Get It Together, Metroid Dread in the fall as well. No More Heroes 3 is coming out this year. Uh, Shimigami Tensei 5. Again, all of these games are pretty um, impactful, relatively. Some more than others. Some some will sell more copies than others, but even the ones that are less uh, financially successful, still, creatively speaking, will be interesting. Or are interesting. I, I know I missed a couple games. There's there are other games also coming out throughout the year, at least three more. So it's looking like a pretty good year, which is kind of funny because since I don't own a Switch anymore, maybe it would be better if I felt vindicated <laughs> by making the decision to uh, sell my Switch for next to nothing. I mean, I didn't even really sell it. I gave it away, but... Even so, even even if this year is pretty good, I'm not. I don't regret getting rid of my Switch and all. And um, to tie back to tie that back to E3, even though this E3 was pretty good, um, I just saw a similar issue that I have always seen with the Switch year after year, and that is an assembly line problem. They announced Metroid Dread because they didn't have anything to show for Metroid Prime 4. I mean, they would have announced it anyway, but that's... They literally talked about Metroid Prime 4, saying they, they're working hard on it, and then they their offering to the rabid fans was Metroid Dread. That's how it was framed. At Zelda, like I said, that game is... Coming out in 2022. They didn't give it a date for when that is. So that will probably be moved up to late 2022. And that game is built off a 
built off the engine of another game, and yet it's going to take five years to develop, maybe five and a half years. That's pretty terrible in terms of a turnaround time. And, and um, there's other... There's other series that I would have maybe expected to hear an announcement from during the C3, and I didn't at all, such as Kirby. Uh, it's been a while since the last Kirby game, so I feel like another one should have been on the way, and yet it wasn't. And so, with all this uh, assembly line problems, I felt inspired to do a thing that I wanted to do for a while, and that was catalog every game uh, that was being developed by each uh, Nintendo first party team or second party team or even a closely associated uh, third party team teams and companies that had developed exclusives for Nintendo in the past and I wondered why I never I never did this before but seeing as it took me like two days just to get it done I'm sure a normal human being could have gotten done in one but you know I have my special issues. So I did that. That took me a long time. But I feel like after developing um, these charts, I I would feel comfortable saying that what I have to say about their assembly line problems is far from hearsay. It's fact. And it's not just because of COVID-19 affecting development in 2021. This is a ongoing problem throughout the entire lifespan of the Switch. And... You could maybe try to make the argument that the Switch is super young. And granted, the Switch will have a longer lifespan due to the uh, nature of when it came out. But the typical console generation for Nintendo lasts five years, give or take. Some last longer, some are shorter. But that's how long they typically last. And Nintendo Switch is in its fifth year. Quite well into its fifth year now, so... The fact that certain franchises and uh, development teams are only getting the things they've been working on out now, and in some cases they haven't even gotten what they were working on out yet into the public, that's concerning. But I will get into detail exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about developer output and the... uh, the assembly line issues I'm, I've mentioned. So I made two charts, and one chart was the Nintendo development teams, and it was recording what games they had released, what games you know that were tied to them in a 12-year period from 2010 to the end of 2021. Now I should say that with Nintendo. They have their bigger teams, and then they have their smaller teams, and then they have their fetch and carry uh, teams, support staff. And it gets very complicated exactly what each team was working on. For instance, Goodfeel apparently developed the giant battles in um, Dream Team, uh, Mario & Luigi Dream Team back in 2013. And so... In that case, I know exactly what they did in that game, but that's not always the case. A lot of these games are co-developed, and then there's Intelligent Systems, which works on everything. Intelligent Systems is like the backbone of Nintendo. They are as present as Nintendo EPD almost. And so Nintendo and Intelligent Systems are often working on games together, or sometimes Intelligent Systems is just working on a game by itself. And then Nintendo EPD used to be multiple teams. You had Tokyo EAD, you had uh, Kyoto EAD. I think there's two different EAD groups in Tokyo. And then there was Nintendo R&D or SPD. I I think SPD. And then there's like three groups within SPD. One was doing publishing, another developing... um, the famous R&D 1, I believe, R&D 2, is Sakamoto, and they were always doing handheld stuff. And that's where Metroid and WarioWare come from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now, with all the merging of teams and things r- related to that, it is interesting what exactly uh, 
what exactly each development team does. And it's not always clear, but at the end of the day, it's just a matter of I could put a bean in this pile of beans or I could put the bean in this pile of beans. It doesn't matter. It's all going to uh, come up to the same account and will represent more or less the same issue. So my, my um, system, a, a lot of it's um, somewhat speculative and most of this was taken off Wikipedia or fan sites. You know, it's not, this isn't an official list, but I'm pretty happy with how it came together. I did make some errors where at one point I had the game's releases according to their U.S. releases because I'm ethnocentric, but then I decided that the uh, workload would be better understood if I did them according to their Japanese releases because the lion's share of development is obviously taking place within that time period. Localization is a big job, but it's a big job for much fewer people. So there are some discrepancies, and I probably can't even upload this list to my uh, podcast page as much as I'd like, but I'm going to go through it pretty in depth, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So starting with Next Level Games, um, they, they have, um, they're, they've, in terms of what they've developed, they've actually done a really good job um, with their development staff. There's four ratings I'd give each development, development team. There's Excelling, maintaining, declining, and then MIA or dead in the water. So they are definitely, I'd say they're excelling. They're somewhere between excelling and maintaining. They, from 2010 to 2019, they have released a game, it would seem, every three years. In 2010, they did Ghost Recon, which wasn't a great game, but whatever. Uh... Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon in 2013, which was a sizable development. Federation Force in 2016, a much bigger game than people give it credit for. And 2019 was Luigi's Mansion, which was a huge undertaking in terms of assets. Well, not huge. I mean, talking about Xbox 360 level graphics. It's a 7th gen console to switch, but that game, graphically speaking, looked really good. It looked better than Mario Odyssey. It looked better than... Uh, Breath of the Wild, very good looking game. So next level games, they are doing just fine. They are um, pulling their weight. Retro, on the other hand, hasn't done anything since 2014. Absolutely nothing. I heard something that they maybe worked on Labo a bit, which Labo is, I mean, Labo's nothing. Like in terms of software development, there's hardly anything that went into that. In terms of content. Anyway, in terms of developing the player mechanics, I'm sure there's a bit of development, but not a big project at all. But that's the only thing I heard of what they were doing. They've, they've done nothing. Uh, in 2010, they had Donkey Kong Country Returns. 2014, Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze, which was a masterful game and a huge undertaking. But now they apparently have done nothing. And a lot of people might forgive this when Metroid Prime 4 comes out, but not me. I don't actually care about Metroid Prime 4's development so much. What I care more about is trying to figure out what they were doing for five years between 2014 and 2019 when they announced that Retro Studios was taking over for Bandai Namco and that game's development. But five years passed and... um. They have nothing to show for that five years. So Retro Studios, they're MIA. They've done nothing for the Switch. And then Intelligent Systems, as I said, they there's nothing really too concerning with their output. It seems pretty consistent. I might say there's been a slight decline in what games they were making almost, but not really. They're just maintaining their stellar record of releasing a game every year and... I forgot to mention, when it comes to these games, I'm pretty generous about what I consider a game worth talking about. Because this list has nothing to do with quality of the game. It's the quantity. I'm looking at development time that's being put into these games. Obviously, a really good game probably had more development put into it because they gave it a second uh, pass. Even so, 
I'm just looking at how many games they've released. Uh, some games are better than others. Some games are bigger than others. And I, if a game's really small and slight, I'll acknowledge that in this chart. But yeah, retro or intelligent systems, they're fine. So next level games and intelligent systems are doing fine in terms of their output. Intelligent systems is a juggernaut when it comes to that. But retro, they're just dead in the water. They're doing nothing. Uh, Monolith Soft, same thing as next level games. They, um, I don't know when they exactly picked up Steam. I, maybe with the release of Xenoblade Chronicles, but ever since then they've been releasing a game every two, three years, pretty consistently. And more than that, they do a lot of um, work for the Zelda team. They did Skyward Sword, they did Breath of the Wild, they're probably doing Breath of the Wild too. So their development is going smoothly. Nothing wrong with Monolith Soft. Because, yeah, you had Xenoblade X in 2015, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 in 2017, a couple Project X zones in between there, and Xenoblade Chronicles Remake in 2020. And then moving from a big developer to a much smaller developer, we have NST, Nintendo Software Technologies, which this is not a big team. I think they uh, they used to work on Wave Race and stuff, and there was a falling out between their management and um, their uh, development staff. But since 2010, uh, they've been doing Mario vs. Donkey Kong, uh, Mario vs. Donkey Kong, Mini Land Mayhem 2010, 2013, Minis on the March 2015, Tipping Stars... Uh, Mario vs. Donkey Kong, Amiibo, and Friends. And they also worked on Super Mario Maker 3DS, which wasn't a simple port. There was actually a lot of new content within that game done by NST. But since then, since 2017, they did... Or 2016, but since 2016, they did Flip Wars. And I didn't even want to include this game because the game's so insubstantial. Unsubstantial? Insubstantial? I don't know. <laughs> well, not of substance. The game is not of substance. But that's all they've done in a uh, five-year period in terms of new content. I know they did some port work for Super Mario 3D World, but that's a port. That's not... It's not going to drive... That's not going to... I don't know. They're a smaller team, but they, yeah, they haven't been doing anything really in terms of original content, which is what this chart is focusing on. It's focused on original content that's exclusive to Nintendo, or if it's not exclusive, it was um, at one point very closely associated with Nintendo, so even though it's multi-platform now, it's still very associated with Nintendo. It's a Nintendo product. So NST, though, NST is dead. They're doing nothing. Monster Games. Next, Monster Games is known for doing Excite Truck and Excite Bots, but that's before this period. Um, but they did Pilot Wings Resort in 2011. They did the port of Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D, which, like Super Mario 3D World with NST, um, that's not necessarily a big project. I only included it because they did develop eight new levels for um, the port and there's also a lot of work going into making the entire game 3d i assume and um m more importantly in 2014 they were co-developing tropical freeze and so with their work on donkey kong country returns and with actually doing work with retro on tropical freeze an original title they also they i figured they could probably put together a Donkey Kong game, a Donkey Kong Country game for Nintendo with the right kind of funding and if they beefed up their development team. But unfortunately, none of that happened. They are dead in the water. What they're working on now is um, NASCAR games for PC. They are doing nothing for Nintendo. The last thing they did was a, a 3DS port of Exceedably Chronicles. So a smaller team, but they definitely have the capacity to make a game. Or they did have the capacity, but Nintendo didn't support them or 
didn't want to keep them around. The, the monster games like NST, like retro, they're nowhere to be found. So that's that's like three developers already though that are are not holding their own weight. And then you have Suda Fifty One, which he's coming out with No More Heroes Three now, and that's not. I would say his support of Nintendo had already declined in the Wii U days, but the Wii U wasn't financially viable, so it makes sense why he didn't support them. And it would make sense why there would be a general decline in the 2012 to 2017 or 2016 period. But you'd expect that support to come back with the Switch, which has sold like 95 million units probably, or probably clear 100 million shipped by the end of this year. Um, but yeah, somehow for him, he didn't develop anything till No More Heroes 3. There was Travis Strikes Again, but that was like that was like an indie game from him, which he is kind of indie, but he was always sort of double A. And that game, I didn't play it, so maybe I'm going to eat crow on this. But the, that game looked like nothing. Like Gameplay-wise, content-wise, it was small fries compared to his previous stuff. But yeah, after four and a half years, give or take, uh, he has a game finally coming out for the Switch. So his support, I would say, is declining. I mean, it was had already declined. Um, Camelot, after that, Camelot's been pretty consistent with their releases, though I would say they're only maintaining what they're doing. Like, they're, I'm giving them a pass, but it's not like they've really increased in their development output because they had a game coming out every other year uh, prior to the switch days and then they did some work on superstar sports but that was developed mostly by bandai namco i'm figuring like with camelot doing a supervisory kind of a role <laughs> But after that, it takes them three years to develop Mario Tennis, uh, from Mar going from Mario Tennis Ultra Smash to, to Mario Tennis. And Mario Tennis Ultra Smash was a slight game, don't get me wrong, but it was still a game they had developed. It probably needed another six months to fully come together. But a lot of that, what they did for Ultra Smash, ended up in Mario Tennis Aces. So it definitely matters in terms of uh, HD development which that was the one game in their list for the 12-year period. That was uh, their first HD-developed game. But then it took them three years for Mario Tennis. And Mario Tennis Aces, it came out kind of hot. Like, it, it didn't have a lot of features that it needed to have, and they kind of fixed the game with post-content. But they didn't, they didn't beef up the game. They fixed it, which means that it took them predominantly, like, three years to or two and a half, let's say, to make a game that wasn't complete when it came out. And the game's not that hefty in terms of content, even if the fundamentals are good. And then with Mario Golf Super Rush, it kind of sounds like the same thing um, compared to all the other golf games that came before it. This is probably the weakest of them from the sounds of it. Comparing it to the GBA game, the, the GameCube game, Toadstool Tour, and Mario Golf World Tour, which came out in 2014. Those games sound significantly better, significantly more beefy, more content. This one has a single player, which seems kind of uh, not that great. Seems like a tutorial more than anything. Not exactly. A lot of development went into that, necessarily. It's something, though. And then the, even the amount of courses seem kind of slight. Um, there's also Arena Golf and Speed Golf. So it's not like... The game isn't incomplete, but it seems slight in the same way that Mario Tennis Aces was. So they it's taking them three years to kind of develop games that aren't really full featured and are missing obvious features that they all then have to fix. Like Mario Golf doesn't have any of the interesting challenges present in Toadstool Tour and uh, World Tour. Even so, Camelot, again, this isn't really a qualitative uh, list. It's more quantitative. I'm just saying quantitatively speaking, their games that they're making Camelot aren't all that uh, content rich. And then you get to Nintendo EPD, though prior to 2015 they weren't Nintendo EPD, so I had to go into EAD and SPD. 
This one's like really disappointing because their content is definitely decreasing majorly. Like in 2010, they were doing Super Mario Galaxy, Metroid Other M, uh, 2011 Rhythm Heaven, Fever, Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, Nintendo, Nintendo Dogs plus Cats, Mario Kart 7, Super Mario 3D Land, you know, like five releases or four or five releases in 2011 alone. And then there's three in 2012 and sort of that kind of three to five games coming out in each year, more even in a lot of cases. And then from 27, 2016, all they had was Miitopia. But then it was all well and good because then they had one, two switch, which that game in terms of development, that game was put together in maybe six months. The game's trash. But then they had Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, though I would argue that game was developed and done in 2016. But that came out in 2017. ARMS, which Splatoon 2, Mario Odyssey. So um, there's a lot of titles in 2017. Um, Some of them are slighter than others. So it looks like they're doing what they are always doing is my point. But then from 2018... On all they developed was Labo for one year, Super Mario Maker 2, and Ring Fit Adventure for 2019. For 2020, Animal Crossing New Horizons is the only thing they developed. And then for 2021, Garage Builder or Game Garage Builder. Like that's all that they're doing. I didn't include Skyward Sword because that game looks so um Like, they did nothing with it. It's pretty much a very simple remaster, so I'm not going to include that that on the list. They haven't done anything with it. But I did include Wind Waker HD into back in 2013 because that game had a lot of development put into it. Like, new weather effects, uh, changes to the enemy patterns, uh, gyroscope controls, uh, UI differences, like major UI changes, Miiverse integration, uh, changes to the camera system uh fixes you know that the game is a new game in a way that it is the that version of the game is defined by being on the wii u skyward sword no so that's why i didn't include it so yeah like basically my point is, is that you're going from the first six years or so multiple releases sometimes three sometimes like five varying in um development time obviously down to it seems like average one a year in the last four switch years that's um dreadful i assume in 2022 you might get a new mario game and you'll get zelda 2 so that will kind of remedy it somewhat but not really like so all in all in short massive decline for nintendo epd like i we're it's pretty close to massive Ubisoft with their um, titles, same thing. They had a lot of exclusives coming out in the early years, in the later years of the Wii and in the early years of the Wii U. Since then, they have Mario plus Rabbids, which it makes sense why they decline in the Wii U days because their games weren't selling. But I would expect that their games would have come back, and they haven't. Um. They have one game in 2017 and then another game in 2022. That's it for exclusives from Ubisoft or Ubisoft. I don't know how you say their name. Um, Surprisingly, after that, though, ND Cube, they're holding the line. Um, Their best games are behind them. They're not particularly good at making Mario Party games, as I understand it, as Super Mario Party was pretty terrible on the Switch and pretty slight. But otherwise, uh, they did Clubhouse games on the Switch, which was a sizable undertaking enough. And then they're doing Mario Party Superstars. And then prior to that, uh, there's been no decline in their work for Nintendo. Their game's quality is of middling reception, but that's neither here nor there for this list. Capcom, a uh, pretty sharp decline. Up until recently, they finally started releasing Monster Hunter Rise and Monster Hunter Stories back in in this year. Prior to that, all they did for the Switch in terms of exclusives was Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate, which is not exactly a massive undertaking. It's an up-res of a 3D game they did in uh, 2017, I believe. Yeah, in 2017. 
Really, I'd just say from 2017 on, they've really done nothing up until this year. Um, so sharp decline from Capcom, who had done all the other Monster Hunter games on the 3DS, and they had done the Ace Attorney games, and uh, the great Ace Attorney games, which are being ported to the Switch now. Pretty simple ports from the look of them, by the way, so not including them on their release schedule, because it's nothing. Those great Ace Attorney games were released in Japan in 2015 and 2016, I believe. And uh, also just the other ones that came to to the West. So a lot of stuff from um, Capcom. And they're pretty much doing nothing. So I put them on the decline rather than MIA because they're releasing stuff now. But prior to that, they were doing nothing. And then you have Platinum Games. Um, Platinum Games is... Also on the decline, because all they've done is release Astral Chain in 2019. And in the Wii days, from 2013 to 2016, they had released three games. Wonderful 101, Bayonetta 2, and Star Fox Zero. In a, what looks to be a six-year period, they might get two games out if Bayonetta 3, Bayonetta 3, my apologies, comes out in 2022. So their support's on the decline as well. Bandai Namco, their support's also on the decline. They did Disney's Zoom Zoom, which the fact that I included that, as I said, this is a generous list in terms of development time. They also have Zoids in 2021. But prior to that, though, they had their own casual party games coming out. Um, some Ace Combat games. Uh, they did Pokin for the Wii U in 2016. And uh, then they did like other uh, licensed games and other casual games. But on the Switch, there's some of that casual licensed stuff, but really nothing. Bandai Namco, on the decline. Alpha Dream isn't on the decline, or MIA, they're just dead. And this would tie into my whole thing of like, what I'm doing with this list is I'm not necessarily talking about the developers so much. Like, I'm not putting the blame on them necessarily. What I'm saying is these developers probably would be doing more with the Nintendo consoles if there was an incentive, if there was better developer support, if there was um, more financial means in developing for these for these Nintendo systems. Something like that. And in the case of Alpha Dream, if there wasn't, I would argue, mismanagement on someone's part. Because Alpha Dream, they were pretty much trucking along doing their typical, let's say, a Mario and Luigi every three to four years with Dream Team and then Paper Jam in 2013 and 2015. But then in 2017 and 2018, they did remasters for Superstar Saga and Bowser's Inside Story that were not financially successful and now they went bankrupt which why they went bankrupt i don't know whose decision was it to make these games that weren't going to sell well in the first place because the switch was taking off from the get-go so why they put these games on 3ds i don't know they didn't sell well and alpha dream is dead so no more alpha dream Uh, then you have game freak which they're essentially maintaining their course um i will make the complaint that game freak makes games that look like they're made for the 3ds but they're up to 1080 so they're not really going to get too many accolades from me uh, but yeah they're they're trucking along though i will say diamond and pearl on the switch looks like absolute garbage for a company that sells like 15 million copies of a pokemon game every other year or every year they can put more money into their development it's embarrassing. Goodfield, which is a strange developer because they really don't release games all that often. Like there's five years between Epic Yarn and Yoshi's Woolly World. And then there's uh, Crafted World, which came out in 2015. Uh, four years between Yoshi's Woolly World and Yoshi's Crafted World. So they're trucking along, but they don't really do things all that quick. Grezzo is on the decline because they used to do multiple projects for a year some years they take breaks in 2011 they had ocarina of time 3d um they probably did some other development in these intermittent years but then in 2015 they had legend of zelda mojor's mask 3d which was a big undertaking um legend of legacy they also did some work on with that developer they also co-developed um triforce heroes with nintendo 
And then in 2017, they did their own project, Ever Oasis, and they also worked on Alliance Alive. This is another thing of Nintendo mismanaging, I imagine. They did Luigi's Mansion, the remake, in 2018. And it's my understanding that a bit of work went into this uh, remaster. Not a remake, a remaster. Like new textures and stuff, so it's not like they just farted it out. But this was already 2018. Ever Oasis being in 2017 was gutsy as it was, but... Yeah, and then, but they're on the decline because all they've done for the Switch is Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening remake, which a sizable project, but not it's not exactly a graphically intensive game. And now they're porting over Miitopia in 2021, probably the lamest casual game of the 3DS and Wii U era, if I had to guess. Um, but, you know, because they did work on Luigi's Mansion... Um, I'm going to say they're declining rather than MIA, but otherwise, in terms of, they haven't done anything since 2017 except for Link's Awakening, really. How Laboratories, um, this one was surprising because up till 2017 and 2018, they were releasing Kirby games left and right. 2011, they did Mass Attack and Return to Dreamland, and then, then they had a break, and then they had did Triple Deluxe, they did Rainbow Curse. They did Planet Robobot. All of those Kirby games released one year after the other. And then they were also doing games besides those games. Uh, Box Boy. They were releasing DLC games that were add-ons to their original Kirby games. And they were cheap add-ons, like five bucks. But they had a, a certain amount of content to them. So it's not like they haven't done anything. But then after the release of Star Allies, the only things they've released... And they have nothing announced for 2021... The only things they released in three years is the essentially touch-ups of those add-on games that they had already worked on for the 3DS in like 2014 and 2016. But nothing else. They've done nothing else. They did a Box Boy collection or maybe I think it was like a collection slash like a remix maybe, but they, I don't think it was a new Box Boy game. So they've, they've done nothing for a, what will be essentially four years or in 2022, I assume there'll be a Kirby game, but four years for one of those that's Kirby is not that big in terms of development that it should take that long. So, I mean, how laboratory is dead in the water, smaller. I mean, I could go to speed it up. I mean, I could talk about van pool as well. Van Poole, which was doing Dylan's Rolling Western and Last Ranger and Dead Heat Breakers in 2018. Haven't seen anything from them in three years. Granted, they did Dead Heat Breakers in 2018 and they're a smaller developer, but for uh, three years, haven't done anything. So they're on the decline at the very least. Sora, LTD, I put on the decline because the only thing they've done for the Switch is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. In the Wii U days, in the 3DS days, they did Kid Icarus Uprising, a very big game to develop. And then they did two different versions of Super Smash Brothers, which were so different from each other. I wouldn't say it's the equivalent of developing two games, but it's definitely the equivalent of developing one and a half games, as opposed to one game on the Switch, which the Switch game was the greatest hits uh, game. There's a lot of stuff to remaster and touch up, so it was some kind of undertaking, certainly, but I've never been impressed with Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. It's never wowed me the amount of content, because with how well those games sell and the fact that none of that content is new unless you pay a hefty premium to get all the new stuff, or I suppose you could handpick what fighters you want, but they that game is massively expensive for what it is if you want to get actual new content in it. And the new content in it sucks, too. Like, there's not a lot of development time that went into that. Specifically, World of Light. And then another smaller development team, Vite. Uh, I put them on decline rather than MIA because they've done nothing in four years. But they were never a big developer. They did Steel Diver 2011, Steel Diver Sub Wars 2014, and Tank Troopers in seven, 2017. Not huge games, but they were small little things that this developer was working on. And then Vite did other work with uh, other development teams. Again, fetch and carry developer. But for four years, nothing. They have done nothing. Arzest, which is not anybody's favorite developer, they haven't done anything in four years. 
um, since Hey Pikmin. So they're, I don't know, I'd say they're, I'd put them on the decline, but they might be MIA. The only new addition when it comes to developers actually doing things for Nintendo is Mercury Steam um, with Metroid Samus Returns in 2017, Metroid Dread in 2021. Uh, so they're they're doing pretty good. I wouldn't say they're excelling, though. I don't know what about Metroid Dread looks like it needs four years to develop. Obviously, Mercury Steam has its own thing going with another free-to-play shooter, but they should have, Nintendo, that is, should have incentivized them to immediately go over to Metroid Dread, or Nintendo should have started laying the groundwork or provided better support so Mercury Steam could get this game done quicker. Because the game looks pretty good. But if you zoom in on it, like, the assets in that game aren't incredibly intensive at all. They're they're designed to look at that game from a distance. And it looks pretty good from a distance, but up close, the Switch is a 7th gen console in terms of power and the assets for it. And so I don't know why it takes four years to make a uh, Metroid game. A game like uh, Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze taking four years, I'd get, because that game is massive and how many assets it has but this game it's not really going to be the case i don't imagine but yeah four years not great especially when a lot of these teams now have had a chance to work with ht assets and um the entire industry has been working with hd on the consoles anyway since 2005 so it's not really, I'm not going to buy the idea that HD development has caused this rapid decline in their games. And if it has, that's not any good. Nintendo, who makes a bunch of money and is charging $20 more for their, um, from their handheld, their, their handhelds used to be $40 and now they're up to 60 So if $8 of that $20 went into more development, um, staff, I think that's reasonable. And then the other stuff is, I don't know, distribution and uh, profit. But yeah, they, I'm not the whole, it's HD and it takes a long time to develop. I'm not buying that. Nintendo charges the same amount of money for games that other companies do. And it might not be a perfect one to one comparison with how they develop games, but this. Yeah, four years for Metroid Dread is not exactly um, ideal. But even so, Mercury Steam, they're maintaining what they've been doing. And then we have Square Enix, which is also on the decline. They've their games that they've been making. They used to do a bunch of Kingdom Hearts games and Bravely Default and Fortune Street, Dragon Quest. Um, they've essentially, since 2017, they haven't done much of anything um they've done trials of manor and brave default 2 and octopath traveler so they're still doing stuff but way less then moving on to atlas guess what also on decline atlas they had their etrian odyssey series they had their smt spin-offs uh, persona q trauma team There was also Tokyo Mirage Sessions back in 2015, came to the West in 2016. Uh, But then, compared to uh, Atlas Now, aside from Persona Q2, which probably was already out in 2016, and Etrian Odyssey Nexus, both of those came out in 2018, uh, Atlas hasn't done a single thing um, since SMT5, which is coming out this year. So for yeah, three years, not a single release from them. So they're they're declining compared, to, especially compared to what they've been doing. Smaller companies that are more indie, like Way Forward, they're maintaining a lot of the games that were exclusive to Nintendo are now multi-platform, but they remain also on Nintendo platform. So I included them, and now they're also working on Advance Wars One Plus Two. Shinnin, um, I feel like they have less releases, but their releases are getting bigger, so they're maintaining. In 2019, they did The Tourist, which was a pretty decent game. Saga 
is maintaining, I would say, though only barely. It's been a while since they did a Sonic game, and they're still doing Hatsune Miku games and uh, Mario and Sonic games at the Olympics. Though even those to a smaller degree. And now in 2021, they have the Super Monkey Ball collection, which is a nice remaster pack with updated HD graphics. So that's something. And then these two next two companies, Inti Creates and Koei Tecmo. Um, Koei Tecmo, I mean, they just work on Warriors games mostly, so I'm not really going <laughs> to... I, I don't know. They, even so, Warrior Games aside, they are consistently releasing a game almost every year. So that's good on them. NT Creates is not maintaining, it's actually excelling, where they've now started many more projects than they were doing in the early days. So no complaints with NT Creates. Skip was already in its death throes in the 3DS Wii U days, but they haven't done anything in six years, so they're dead in the water. Prope, after Rodea of the Sky Soldier and um, Balon Secret World, or whatever it's called, uh, they're probably dead in the water. Uh, Xseed is maintaining their typical releases with Senran Kagura, Kagura whatever it's called, um, and... Other things in Rune Factory. Natsume is kind of on the decline with Harvest Moon. It seems like Harvest Moon hasn't done anything in three years. Not since 2018. They might be done as a franchise. And then the last developer I'd talk about is Erica, which they were doing Endless Ocean back in the day and other things, but they since moved to sort of smaller eShop kind of games. And they've maintained that with releases of Tetris 99, Super Mario 35, and Pac-Man 99. They're also working on Fighting X Lair. They're, they're maintaining. In short, some of these developers are maintaining. And um, I'd expect them to gain some developers and lose some developers. But it would seem like they've only lost lots of these developers, like Monster... Monster Games, Skip's gone, RZS might be gone. Retro, no idea what they're doing. They're not gone, but they're definitely MIA. <sighs> hmm. But yeah, um, either, either MIA dead or on the decline when it comes to the Switch. And as a result, when I then look at their franchises... Started with Mario on a major decline. They had a Mario game coming out every year from 2010 to 2016 or 2010 to 2017. Now for the last four years, uh, all they have is Super Mario Maker. And I guess Bowser's Fury is like a third of a game. So like one and three quarters, one and a third of a game has come out in four years. And probably in 2022, there will be another one. So that's two games in five years. Uh, the Wii brand games, not really Wii brand, but those sorts of games with Miis, those are essentially dead. Um, they put out Ring Fit and Brain Training in 2020, which is in Japan. I don't know how big Brain Training was, but that essentially died in 2013, and a lot of great games were part of that franchise, so they don't have those in the games they replaced them with, 1-2-Switch and Labo. And Ring Fit. And I, again, Brain Training. I don't really know much about that. But of those three games I do know about, only Ring Fit really landed. 1-2-Switch is garbage, and Labo is such a missed opportunity. Their casual games, I'd say there's been a decline to Clubhouse Games in 2020. And Mario and Sonic kind of keep that presence there. Uh, Mario Kart... They haven't done anything with Mario Kart since 2014, other than a RC game, which is not really a video game. That's more of a... That's a toy. Seven years, going on eight years. Eight years to wait for a Mario Kart when they had one in 2011 and 2014. Um, 
I mean, think about that. For in the past, Nintendo was able to develop not one but two Mario Karts per generation. One for the handheld and one for the console. And there's nothing for the Switch. Not even one. Mario Sports, uh, they're still, they're maintaining. Mario Party's maintaining. So you have those two B-tier franchises that are maintaining. But then these first party ones, which I would include Wii brand games as first party. Those are big games. Uh, They've all majorly declined. Um, MIA almost. Mario vs. Donkey Kong. Since 2016, haven't seen anything from that. Again, not the greatest games ever made, but they were a fun little thing. They're gone. Paper Mario's maintaining with uh, releases, one per console. Uh, Mario, Mario and Luigi, they were kind of active till 2018, but they're now dead. Um, you could argue they were dead since 2015, though, since that was their last original game. Zelda, um, not straight up MIA, but as I said, Breath of the Wild was essentially a 2016 game that they ported over to the Switch in 2017. I highly doubt they did any extensive work on the Wii U version in those days other than gutting it for its very special features, which would have made it a better game on the Wii U, um, at least in terms of home play. But uh, yeah, comparing... Zelda, which had two releases per year or every other year almost in in the past. Now they have Link's Awakening remake and um, uh, Breath of the Wild on Switch. And then Hyrule Warriors, which is not even really a Zelda game. So you, you really don't have that much going on. Definitely a decline when it comes to Zelda. That, that's it. They Again, if you consider the fact that Breath of the Wild is a game that was coming out in 2016, which I guess is like cheating. We'll say it came out in 2017. Uh, but Zelda has been on the decline in the last four years with only a spin off and a remake. Five, if you think of Breath of the Wild being um, what it is, which is a Wii U game that they ported over. Uh, Splatoon is a new franchise, it's maintaining essentially. Splatoon 3 has taken five years, but it took five years because you really didn't even need another Splatoon on the Switch, maybe. What they really needed to do was make the second Splatoon an actually good sequel. As it stands, like the whole idea of Splatoon 1.5 is very much a real thing, in my opinion. And I would say the first game is superior, outside of some quality of life issues. And then we have Animal Crossing, again, on the decline as it took them, what, maybe eight years to develop New Horizons from New Leaf. There was some filler in the middle in 2015 with Happy Home Designer and Amiibo Festival, so that's something, but uh, Animal Crossing's on the decline in terms of uh, development, and Animal Crossing games prior were, yeah, they were scarce in terms of their release schedule with four years between Animal Crossing, New Leaf, and City Folk. But still, Pokemon, I mean, they're, I'd say they're on the decline because their asset work sucks, but they're still maintaining their own. Smash Brothers is maintaining Donkey Kong Country, return, Donkey Kong Country, uh, just Donkey Kong Country, my apologies. That's on the decline. Haven't seen anything since 2014. Not even on the decline. It's MIA. Luigi's Mansion's maintaining. Pikmin is MIA with only Hey Pikmin having come out in 2017. And the last Pikmin game coming out in 2013. Uh, Metroid is, I would say it's maintaining, but in a way it's actually back from the dead. Seeing as in 2016 it was Federation Force, 2017 Samus Turns, and now Dread in 2021. So Metroid's doing fine. Fire Emblem's doing fine. Kirby, as I already mentioned, missing in action, essentially. It's quite on the decline. They should have had a new Kirby game out by now. But they've done nothing. Advance Wars, I guess it's back from the dead, but it's just a pretty simple-looking remake. But So that's fine. Uh, Yoshi's Island is maintaining. 
WarioWare, I would have said it was on the decline, but with Get It Together, it's essentially maintaining. Though they used to come out with WarioWare games way more often than they did. So it's essentially declined since 2009 on uh, Star Fox. It's kind of dead. I mean, it was already dead prior to this. Uh, small first priority projects on the decline as all these little games like NES Remix, the 3D Classics, uh, Tank Trooper, Steel Diver, Fling Smash, stupid games like that that came out. Uh, they're, none of those games are on Switch. And I should include within this list the small first priority projects. There was also um, games like Art Academy done by Headstrong Games, which only would work on the Wii U and 3DS. They went bankrupt, so they're dead, and Art Academy with them for the time being. And then other things like Street Pass and um, Miiverse. I brought up Art Academy because Miiverse really utilized Art Academy, and Miiverse was just a great idea in general. That that kind of software attached to the hardware doesn't exist on Switch at all. Nobody's developed it. It's the Switch. The Switch is a software that's built in sucks. Everything about it, from little quality of life things to creative choices like Street Pass or the aforementioned Miiverse, none of that exists. Those, those are all dead. Uh, when it comes to Ubisoft, quite a sharp decline from what they used to do. Like Rayman Legends didn't end up being an exclusive, but it was an exclusive. It just, financially speaking, did become an exclusive. But the optimal way to play that game is Wii U. But since 2013, they really haven't done anything other than Mario plus Rabbit. And that's taken them five years to do two of those. Or five, five years between the two games, more or less. Uh, Monster Hunter, also on the decline with Rise and Stories. It's kind of back, but uh, Resident Evil, they had Revelations in 2012, but that's on the decline. SMT, as I mentioned, is on a sharp decline with only SMT coming out now. Ace Attorney, pretty much MIA. Professor Layton, MIA. They're not doing anything on Switch other than some re-releases. Uh, puzzle Games. They are not on the decline, but there's... Well, they are on the decline. There's far less of them. The only puzzle games I can think of is Tetris 99 and Pac-Man 99 and um, I think some Picross games. But Picross 3D is not there. Pushmo World. Uh, those uh, Dr. Luigi and Dr. Mario, that's not there. Other than the NES game for uh, the online system. But yeah. No More Heroes, sharp decline, but that was always the case. Bayonetta, uh, they had two in 2014, nothing since then, so sharp decline for that. Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy, as I mentioned, declines for both of those. Uh, Rhythm Heaven, haven't seen anything since 2015, I believe, or 2016. 2015, so on the decline, pretty much MIA. Sonic is also on the decline, as there's been nothing since Sonic Forces and Sonic Mania in 2017. And I didn't include Sonic Team Racing, because I didn't include it anywhere, because that's a multi-platform release. So is Sonic Forces, but... Whatever, like... Sonic not exactly doing exclusive stuff for Nintendo right now. Chibi Robo, Dead in the Water, since Ziplash. Bravely Default is essentially maintaining, though there is a decline in it as there was nothing for uh, five years or six years even, unless you want to include Octopath Traveler, which did have some of those team members on. Xenoblade Chronicles series is maintaining... Excite series, nothing. Sin and Punishment, last game was 2009. Dillion's Rolling Rest Western is on the decline with nothing since Dead Heat Breakers, but even so, they weren't doing that much. Uh, there's a slight decline in the Harvest Moon, Rune Factory, Story of Seasons, um, Trio. Uh, pretty much, I mean, that's about it. There was some Nintendo one-offs and dead franchises also which i guess with advance wars coming back 
that's a return of a dead franchise. A, a dead franchise. Also, would have been Kid Icarus Uprising, which came back in um, 2012. And same with Star Fox. So even in terms of n dead franchises, um, Nintendo back in the day was better with them than they are now. It's not. It's not great. I've, as I've cited, and you can look this all up for yourself. But I've been pretty um, faithful to explain all of that. Like there is just a sharp decline in their franchises on the Switch. And I always kind of knew this because I feel like other people, well, while other people will compare the Switch to the Wii U, and I would be comfortable comparing them and saying the Wii U was a better system thus far within a four-year period, I don't have to do that because I get to compare the Switch to the Wii U and the 3DS because it is the inheritor, inheritor to both. And this list pretty much validates my concern that Nintendo's uh, output was always kind of crap. 2017 was a pretty good year for the Switch, though I wouldn't say it's as wonderful as people make it sound. It's not the golden year that they say it is. 2018 was a pretty terrible year, mostly ports. Lots of ports on the Switch, and that's what a lot of these little teams are doing, wasting their time on those, and obviously... It's not a waste of time because Nintendo is making high margin profits on those because all they have to do is pay uh, for some port work and some distribution and they're making almost $80 in Canada, $80, $60 per a game of these ports being sold and some of them are selling massive amounts like $30 million for Mario Kart 8, $3 million for Pikmin 3. Um, it's really not... <laughs> there's no incentive for them to be making these new games or making smaller games. They're just making money with these crappy ports, which ports used to be quite... Um, they used to have to justify their existence, like with new play controls for the uh, Pikmin games or, say, Donkey Kong Jungle Bee 2, though arguably... Those controls were worse than the bongo drums. But, you know, they they were doing work. They were selling those games for much cheaper. That used to be the case with remasters. Twilight Princess was $40. Uh, HD Twilight Princess. Uh, Skyward Sword is now 60 And there's definitely more work in Twilight Princess HD than there is in Skyward Sword HD. Unless they reveal right at the end that they did a lot of stuff in Skyward Sword, which even if they did some stuff, they clearly haven't done enough because that game has so much crap in it. But yeah, Nintendo has no reason to be sweating about their low output because they're making money. So really, I guess I blame the consumers who are buying these terrible games for full price. I don't really blame them because a lot of them didn't know the Wii U existed and Nintendo gets to capitalize on that. The people, though, that are on the Nintendo fan sites that are port bagging, however, ugh, those people are the worst, in my opinion. Some ports make sense, especially really important games, but so often with the Switch, they don't do anything that would make that port memorable or superior to the original game, especially. Watching that horrible reticle squiggle around when you shake the controller in the uh, Super Mario Galaxy uh, game for the collection. I said that weird. Watching the reticle squiggle around whenever you shake the Joy-Con in Super Mario Galaxy for the Super Mario 3D collection, that just looks terrible and so distracting. And with the Wii game, you just hid that away until you needed that reticle. But because they don't have an IR camera, it, I don't know, <laughs> it looks, it looks terrible. And then Sunshine was worse because they didn't have analog triggers like they did for the GameCube. Pikmin 3 seems worse. I don't know. And they all cost way more than they need to. 
and they're cheaply made. The only advantage they have is that they're portable, which I had a Switch for two years. Well, I've had it longer than two years, but for the two years that I had it, I worked in a loader job where I had maybe three hours on average every morning to sit and do nothing and could play Nintendo games with impunity in the quiet in a comfortable cab. And yet that didn't sell me on the Switch because the games coming out for it just weren't happening quick enough. And frankly, if I decided to argue quality of Switch games compared to these games that came out prior, I would say the Switch loses that argument pretty handily too. But Really, I, to, to really cap it off, the Switch, I got rid of it because it never mattered to me. It's probably my least favorite Nintendo console. I actively dislike it. And there are so many ways in which I dislike it that my mind just is like a grenade whenever I think about it, where it just goes off in so many directions. And I couldn't really contain all of those thoughts in one episode. So I kind of held off talking about the Switch. But I think this avenue I chose to go down kind of points out my issues with the Switch. And it does so um, quite objectively. Like, I don't think there's too much subjectivity in this chart. I was very, um, very lenient, and I included everything that kind of counted as a new game, even if I didn't like the game or I thought the game was crap. Yeah. And there might be other reasons why there's a decline in games for the Switch, but... There's no current incentive for Nintendo at the moment to remedy this decline in software. And nobody in the fan community seems to want to talk about it because I guess Nintendo fans just want Nintendo to win a console war or something. Or they want the convenience of portable play at the cost of creativity of any kind. They just want to buy games they already own on the next system they own and somehow that is new enough to them i don't know what it is i mean nintendo fandom isn't a monolith but i I would like to see more people youtubers talking heads what have you start to talk about this issue and it's a big issue like it is a sharp decline in how many games they've released and then like I didn't talk about the quality of the games, but um, I think that's also lacking. But yeah, that's that's my thoughts on the Switch. That's why I don't have one anymore, and that's why, even though the C3 was pretty good, it I'm not super wowed, even so. But with all that said, I'm going to move on from this topic and uh i'm gonna go to break and then when we come back we will discuss our game review so stay tuned then welcome back for the initiated you will know that this is the review portion of the show also i said that 30 seconds ago but um, before we get into this review i have some housekeeping to do in regarding to my rankings which i kind of was hesitant to screw around with the rankings too much but I figured, yeah, I I need to change some things. Um, 
So for starters, Goldeneye 007, which I awarded 7 out of 10, I'm moving that score up to 7.5 because I thought my complaints were a bit silly. The final level is pretty dreadful, but the reloading issue I had and the hit scan issue I had, a lot of that can be solved by just being better at the game. And with the amount of fidelity in the aiming, you can pop these enemies before they're before they pop you, even with the aggressive hit scan. And you can also shoot better so you don't have to re reload as often. Otherwise, the it's a very good game. The level design complements both stealth and a loud approach. And it's very complex level design, and there's lots of optional cool things. And the difficulty settings really change how the game feels with multiple objectives and just working off the intricacies of those levels, which are really big levels. Um, so that game's a 7.5, and I'm putting it above Metroid Other M from where it was. I'm putting it above Wario Land Shake It. And I'm putting it above No More Heroes, Desperate Struggle. So I'll go directly underneath Metroid Prime, Corruption. And then No More Heroes uh, 2, Desperate Struggle, I'm putting beneath uh, Wario Land Shake It. I think Wario Land Shake It's better. And I'm going to leave the score of No More Heroes 2 at 7.5, though I'm beginning to think it might be a 7 out of 10 game. It's a really cool, interesting game, but compared to its predecessor, it's not nearly as interesting or as meaningful. But it's it's a, it's just going beneath Wario Land Shake It. Um, and then Red Steel 2, which I think I already mentioned in episode 20 last time I talked about it. I was trying to figure out if Metroid Prime Corruption would go above it or below it. And Metroid Prime Corruption will go below Red Steel 2. I just think Red Steel 2, while it's certainly a smaller game in um, its ideas and scope, just executes so much better than Metroid Prime 3. So that's why I got an 8 out of 10, and that's why Metroid Prime 3 got a 7.5. So Red Steel 2 will be between No More Heroes and uh, Metroid Prime 3. And then there's uh, Wii Sports Resort. I had initially placed below Twilight Princess. And while I might enjoy Twilight Princess more than Wii Sports Resort, I think with the complaints that Steven lodged against that game... I think Wii Sports Resort uh, gains supremacy over Twilight Princess, even though I one's a mini game collection and the other is a very uh, multifaceted experience. But Wii Sports Resort, as I said, is more than a mini game co collection, and it executes what it's going for quite perfectly and gracefully. And as a result, it's a game that you that makes the player want to spend a lot of time in. Like some people probably play that game every summer because it um, has that perfect vibe of a vacation. So Wii Sports Resort takes the number two spot in this uh, ranking and Twilight Princess at number three. Now with all that housekeeping out of the way, that's all done. I'm going to talk about the, the next game. And that game is Excitebots Trick Racing.
This game came out in 2009. It was developed by Monster Games, who I talked about previously in the show. And it is the sequel to Excite Truck. So like Excite Truck, it's a game where while getting first place is certainly beneficial to winning, it is not the main manner in which a racer will win. Rather, the game is about scoring points through tricks, airtime, tree runs, and other extreme uh, escapades. The tracks, like in Excite Truck, they are um, very big. They're still they're not necessarily non-linear, but they are uh, very wide with multiple paths and multiple options to choose from. A lot of the game is figuring out what is the most optimal way to score points and win stars to get the S rank in each of these uh, courses. So the game is very much like Excite Truck. The manner in which it differs, of course, is in the name Excite Bots. And so in this game, you're not going to be driving monster trucks. You are driving these robotic animal vehicles. In addition to driving, these vehicles can stand on two feet, which can be used in certain situations. Um... The vehicles have a crane arm built into them to grab onto things or wield certain items, which comes into play when the game's mini games, uh, with the main with the game's mini games, but I won't talk about those at the moment. And additionally, the general structure of the vehicles also impacts their functionality. For instance, uh, vehicles that are shaped like bats or uh, birds, creatures with wings, have increased gliding capacity over vehicles that are heavier, like the turtle or the centipede or the lobster. And then smaller vehicles might accelerate quicker, and uh, smaller vehicles like a mouse or the I'm not the the crayfish. Or the scorpion, I guess. There's a couple small vehicles. Those vehicles might be able to get high up in the air, but they're not going to maintain airtime as well. So the choice to change vehicles from trucks to animals isn't just an empty choice. Like with the first Excite truck, this game is very uh, motion control intensive. You steer using the Wii wheel style of steering. You don't need the Wii wheel peripheral, but that's how you're steering. Unlike Mario Kart Wii, I find that the game doesn't lose calibration or uh, I never had an issue where the steering became faulty because the steering's sensitive enough that you're not going to be overturning, overcranking the uh, Wii remote like you were in Mario Kart Wii. So that's good. There's no problem with the controls in this game. The only issue I sometimes have is performing a 360. Uh, sometimes it doesn't read it perfectly well. I'm not too sure why that is, but that issue only happens every now and then. But otherwise, you have a boost that you can't abuse. You have landscapes that can change if you hit a certain icon. Uh, you can perform tree runs, get aerial perform aerials, do 360s. It's uh, it's like Excite Bots. The main difference, other than the vehicles, is the mini-games that they introduce. And they're almost very WarioWare-like in how they are, where they're so short and so brief, and they serve as little asides to the racing that could maybe be a distraction or maybe be a detriment to the racing, like... I find the trapeze um, that you cling on to with your crane arm and then you swing around it to pick up speed and pick up air. I find that gets a little tiresome. It's just kind of a little rhythm motion game. But otherwise, anything else is just fine. 
the mini games are so short and so simplistic and yet very hectic, like getting getting five stars on those mini games, and that's what the mini games do. They help you win points, depending how well you do. They're so brief that they never d- distract from the racing, and they are just incorporated into it really well. Um, one mini game would be where you're holding a baseball bat after you run into the icon that activates the mini game, and you just have to wait for the baseball to come, and then you swing the bat, and uh, you get five points, or you are holding a dart, and you have to get a bullseye by aligning your vehicle the right way, or you know, like uh, doing whatever you need to do, manipulating the vehicle to get a bullseye. Uh, on the uh, the dartboard, the giant dartboard that appears in the air at that certain time, or you need to score a field goal with a football that appears, or shoot a soccer ball through a net, or bowl over bowling pins. Just little silly things, and even dumber things like uh, shaking a tambourine, which I never even understood the rhythm behind that game, but you'll win points like that. Uh, there's other asides too, like there's... As I said, you can stand up bipedally, which allows the robot to kind of um, become more durable and go through harder terrain without crashing. And you can also glide when you're in that bipedal state to collect doodads that are shaped like butterflies to win points and silly things like that, grinding on rails like a skateboarder. Uh, So it's not just the mini games. There's also these other things that incorporate the uh, robot form yeah i feel like the game's harder than the original excite bots maybe yeah i think it's harder in order to get an s rank you have to become very good at juggling all these different things that you're doing whether that be gliding or um, aerial tricks or or these mini games or taking shortcuts performing tree runs. Uh, I feel like the courses are narrower, which I kind of don't like. I feel like the original game was more rugged in that you could kind of freestyle more, uh, particularly with tree runs. I love doing tree runs, just weaving through trees that they didn't intend you to weave through and pulling it off is such a great feeling. And there's less chances to do that in this game or less chances to take weird jumps at any point in the map, though you still certainly can. The game is still very uh, freeform compared to a more traditional racer. In addition, as I said, it's it's very hard. They place a lot of hard-to-reach clumps of stars that if you run into them, you'll just get, get them. But a lot of those hard-to-reach stars are through tricky shortcuts or they're through um, performing an aerial maneuver where you have to thread the needle between two obstacles while flying through the air at a fast speed or um, maintaining air enough to get onto a hard to reach uh, spot to then jump off again to then reach those stars way off to the side so really great level design in general and you have to be pretty good at the game to get an s rank but that's really the game in a nutshell um, I will say audiovisually, the game is a pretty big improvement over Excite Truck. The game has a cell shaded art style that it's not incredible, but it looks pretty good, especially the Canadian levels where I think they have a skybox that's like a red hue, kind of like dawn or evening. And then like it looks like Mount Robinson, which is somewhere in B.C., It looks like that's in the background. I could be wrong, but that's what it looks like. It's a very picturesque mountain um, in Canada that can be, when you see it kind of standing by itself, it's very uh, memorable, very distinct. And I think they might have it in the background in this game. They've added new locales. I think Egypt and Tasmania are new. A bunch of the old places return and a bunch of the old levels return. They may have made the levels different and also added new levels. It's definitely not a rehash in terms of content. There's some old content, but there's a bunch of new content as well. There's also some really good modes aside from the typical racing, which you can do cooperatively or online. 
Um, the online, like the original game, has the betting system, which makes collecting stars really uh, enticing. And with those stars, you can buy some really cool vehicles. I think the Lobster. I think that one's pretty expensive, but that's one of the best vehicles. You have to hoard up a lot of stars to get it, though. So there's a good incentive to play the game for a while. And the game doesn't feel that repetitive ever because it's so creative. Another one of the modes, in addition to the online, is there's a mini game mode where you just partake in the mini games, and that's surprisingly fun. Though the mini games are best played alongside normal racing, but the most interesting mode and one you can play online is poker race. And in this mode, you're playing on simplified levels, but. <laughs> What you have is you have a hand that you're building, and you build the hand by collecting cards that are on the track, and there'll be like five, a row of cards, like five of them, and you're building a poker hand, and once you've built the poker hand, I believe you can cash it in at any point, and if you don't want the cards that are on the track, you can lock away your hand so, you're, though, so, you, so the vehicle will just phase through those cards. Um, yeah, you just build a hand to gain points in a certain amount of time. I was able to get an S rank through banking on getting a royal flush. I guess it's the best hand you can get in poker, and it will net you like 150 star points. I assume if you're really good, you can quickly string together uh, a couple pairs here and there. But that, that mode is is very creative, and it's really fun. And if you play it online, I'm sure there's lots of nonsense you can get into where you can um intentionally crash the player who's collecting cards so that they lose their hand or you can make them swerve into the wrong card <laughs> which will screw up their hand things like that so there is um you have to race and be playing poker and it's a really fun dynamic it's a really great mode it's kind of simple but really ingenious really great idea with all that said, that's really maybe all there is to say about the game. Though to quickly summarize, it is a, in short, it's a considerably better game than Excite Truck, even though I really enjoyed Excite Truck. And it doesn't outright replace Excite Truck. I still think there's something about Excite Truck that's really good. But this is a better game in almost every way, and a bigger game, and a lot of really great ideas. The only real complaint I would have against it is um, it lacks character or something like that. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but the game, for all of its variety and crazy ideas and creativity, just doesn't feel like it has um, enough character or personality to be to create a sense of a strong brand like other Nintendo IPs would. It might be that it's cheap, I guess. Like, it... it it doesn't look terribly triple A. It looks pretty good, but it's definitely more of a double A game. And if that's the reason or some other reason, the game kind of lacks personality. Despite that, though, the amount of creativity, the almost perfect execution of motion controls that make the game really fun to play and really great level design and really, really ambitious level design, too and really great side modes, I'd say the game is an 8 out of 10. It's it's just a great game, and I think many people call it a hidden gem on the Wii, and it certainly is. It's a You can buy it really cheap. I definitely recommend it. It's, it's a super memorable game, and there's not a game like it that I can think of. In terms of ranking it, 
which again, I already did this podcast yesterday. So I'll try to speed this along. Really, my main issue with this game is its lack of strong branding or its lack of personality and character, which when comparing it to Wii Sports Resort, Donkey Kong, Country Returns, Twilight Princess, Mario Strikers Charged, and Punch-Out, that kind of is the sticking point for it. And also a lot of those games, Strikers, or not Strikers, um, Donkey Kong Country Returns, Twilight Princess, and Wii Sports Resorts, they also have content to match this game and creativity, half of them, or they're funner to play. So Excite Bots is definitely would go below Donkey Kong Country Returns. It would go beneath Wii Sports Resort, and it would go beneath Twilight Princess HD. It might be more... Um, vast in its scope and ideas than a game like Mario Strikers Charged, but I would say Mario Strikers Charged is way funner to play and considerably more fun to perfect, though I imagine perfecting playing Excite Bots is also really rewarding. But Mario Strikers Charged is a funner game and Mario Strikers Charged has personality to boot. Like that game brimming with personality. That rollerball look that dystopian blood sport look of mario strikers charged um is one of a kind in nintendo so mario strikers charged is a better game than excite bots really the only one that this one was kind of hard to nail down was um uh punch out versus punch out versus excite bots because punch out is a much smaller game and it's doing kind of just the one thing Whereas Excite Bots is a really great blend of ideas that blend quite seamlessly. But Punch Out has way more personality. And ultimately, I think Punch Out is a better game because it's simply more engaging. It's not more fun, it's more engaging because if you don't engage with the game, you are going to get murdered in it. And so every fight, you have to. You get knocked down and have to rebuild yourself up to to beat each new opponent, specifically towards the end. But then you get entitled defense, which is just a every fight in that is hard to varying degrees. Whereas um, Excite Bots can be probably as engaging as Punch Out, maybe even more engaging. But that engagement is optional. You don't really have to engage with it on that level, though you certainly could. So I think with the amount of engagement and the amount of personality that Punch-Out has and the fact that it's audiovisually more pleasing to look at than Excitebots, I think Punch-Out is a slightly better game. It's pretty much a tie, but it's slightly better than Excitebots, which still has a great amount of variety and is more interesting than Punch-Out in many ways. And then the next game would be WarioWare Smooth Moves. And I would say... Excite Bots wins over this game because it's just amount of a uh, it's it's content really. Uh, WarioWare Smooth Moves doesn't have the content or the variety in the content, even though it has quite a bit of variety. <laughs> but um, Excite Bot has more content, and it's just simply a funner game to play than WarioWare Smooth Moves. WarioWare Smooth Moves is as high as it is almost entirely on. The fact that it's a WarioWare game and just brimming with personality. But that personality can't really compete with the amount of content, variety, creativity, and scope of Excitebots. So Excitebots will sit between WarioWare and Punch-Out. And it will have a score of 8 out of 10. Now with all that said, um, that will conclude the show. I'm not going to bother going through the entire rank of games again because it takes such a long time. (laughs) Maybe I'll do it next week. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to send them to nalistenerq at gmail.com. That is nalistenerq at gmail.com. Until next time, have a God-blessed day. Bye-bye.